dawned on me. I am that scientist, Dai, I answered. He paused and then smiled. Sorry, that's my problem. I thought it was yours too. He put out his hand. My name is William F. Buckley. Well, he wasn't exactly William F. Buckley, but he did bear the name of a contentious and well-known TV interviewer, for which he doubtless took a lot of good-natured ribbing. As we settled into the car for the long drive, the windshield wipers rhythmically thwacking, he told me he was glad I was that scientist guy. He had so many questions to ask about science. Would I mind? No, I didn't mind. And so we got to talking, but not, as it turned out, about science. He wanted to talk about frozen extraterrestrials languishing in an Air Force base near San Antonio. Channeling, a way to hear what's on the minds of dead people. Not much, it turns out. Crystals, the prophecies of Nostradamus, astrology, the Shroud of Turin. He introduced each portentous subject with buoyant enthusiasm. Each time I had to disappoint him. The evidence is crummy, I kept saying. There's a much simpler explanation. He was, in a way, widely read. He knew the various speculative nuances on, let's say, the sunken continents of Atlantis and Lemuria. He had at his fingertips what underwater expeditions were supposedly just setting out to find the tumbled columns and broken minarets of a once great civilization whose remains were now visited only by deep-sea luminescent fish and giant kraken. Except, while the ocean keeps many secrets, I knew that there isn't a trace of oceanographic or geophysical support for Atlantis and Lemuria. As far as science can tell, they never existed. By now, a little reluctantly, I told him so. As we drove through the rain, I could see him getting glummer and glummer. I was dismissing not just some errant doctrine, but a precious facet of his inner life. And yet there's so much in real science that's equally exciting, more mysterious, a greater intellectual challenge, as well as being a lot closer to the truth. Did he know about the molecular building blocks of life sitting out there in the cold, tenuous gas between the stars? Had he heard of the footprints of our ancestors found in four million year old volcanic ash? What about the raising of the Himalayas when India went crashing into Asia? Or how viruses, built like hypodermic syringes, slip their DNA past the host organism's defenses and subvert the reproductive machinery of cells? Or the radio search for extraterrestrial intelligence? Or the newly discovered ancient civilization of Ebla that advertised the virtues of Ebla beer? No, he hadn't heard. Nor did he know, even vaguely, about quantum indeterminacy, and he recognized DNA only as three frequently linked capital letters. Mr. Buckley, well-spoken, intelligent, curious, had heard virtually nothing of modern science. He had a natural appetite for the wonders of the universe. He wanted to know about science. It's just that all the science had gotten filtered out before it reached him. Our cultural motifs, our educational system, our communications media had failed this man. What the society permitted to trickle through was mainly pretense and confusion. It had never taught him how to distinguish real science from the cheap imitation. He knew nothing about how science works. There are hundreds of books about Atlantis, the mythical continent that is said to have existed something like 10,000 years ago in the Atlantic Ocean, or somewhere, a recent book locates it in Antarctica. The story goes back to Plato, who reported it as hearsay coming down to him from remote ages. Recent books authoritatively describe the high level of Atlantean technology, morals and spirituality, and the great tragedy of an entire populated continent sinking beneath the waves. There is a New Age Atlantis, the legendary civilization of advanced sciences, chiefly devoted to the science of crystals. In a trilogy called Crystal Enlightenment by Katrina Raphael, the books mainly responsible for the crystal craze in America, Atlantean crystals read minds, transmit thoughts, are the repositories of ancient history and the model and source of the pyramids of Egypt. Nothing approximating evidence is offered to support these assertions. What we almost never find in public libraries or newsstand magazines or primetime television programs is the evidence from seafloor spreading and plate tectonics and from mapping the ocean floor which shows quite unmistakably that there could have been no continent between Europe and the Americas on anything like the timescale proposed. Spurious accounts that snare the gullible are readily available. Skeptical treatments are much harder to find. Skepticism does not sell well. A bright and curious person who relies entirely on popular culture to be informed about something like Atlantis is hundreds or thousands of times more likely to come upon a fable treated uncritically than a sober and balanced assessment. Maybe Mr. Buckley should know to be more skeptical about what's dished out to him by popular culture. But apart from that, it's hard to see how it's his fault. He simply accepted what the most widely available and accessible sources of information claimed was true. For his naivete, 
he was systematically misled and bamboozled. All over the world there are enormous numbers of smart, even gifted people who harbour a passion for science. But that passion is unrequited. Surveys suggest that some 95% of Americans are scientifically illiterate. The consequences of scientific illiteracy are far more dangerous in our time than in any that has come before. It's perilous and foolhardy for the average citizen to remain ignorant about global warming, say, or ozone depletion, air pollution, toxic and radioactive wastes, acid rain, topsoil erosion, tropical deforestation, exponential population growth. Jobs and wages depend on science and technology. If our nation can't manufacture, at high quality and low price, products people want to buy, then industries will continue to drift away and transfer a little more prosperity to other parts of the world. Consider the social ramifications of fission and fusion power, supercomputers, data highways, abortion, radon, massive reductions in strategic weapons, addiction, government eavesdropping on the lives of its citizens, high-resolution TV, airline and airport safety, fetal tissue transplants, health costs, food additives, drugs to ameliorate mania or depression or schizophrenia, animal rights, superconductivity, morning-after pills, alleged hereditary antisocial predispositions, space stations, going to Mars, finding cures for AIDS and cancer. How can we affect national policy, or even make intelligent decisions in our own lives, if we don't grasp the underlying issues? As I write, Congress is dissolving its own Office of Technology Assessment, the only organization specifically tasked to provide advice to the House and Senate on science and technology. Its competence and integrity over the years have been exemplary. Of the 535 members of the U.S. Congress, Rarely in the 20th century have as many as 1% had any significant background in science. The last scientifically literate president may have been Thomas Jefferson. So how do Americans decide these matters? How do they instruct their representatives? Who in fact makes these decisions and on what basis? Diseases that once tragically carried off countless infants and children have been progressively mitigated and cured by science through the discovery of the microbial world, via the insight that physicians and midwives should wash their hands and sterilize their instruments, through nutrition, public health and sanitation measures, antibiotics, drugs, vaccines, the uncovering of the molecular structure of DNA, molecular biology, and now gene therapy. In the developed world, at least, parents today have an enormously better chance of seeing their children live to adulthood than did the heir to the throne of one of the most powerful nations on earth in the late 17th century. Smallpox has been wiped out worldwide. The area of our planet infested with malaria-carrying mosquitoes has dramatically shrunk. The number of years a child diagnosed with leukemia can expect to live has been increasing progressively, year by year. Science permits the Earth to feed about a hundred times more humans and under conditions much less grim than it could a few thousand years ago. We can pray over the cholera victim, or we can give her 500 milligrams of tetracycline every 12 hours. We can try nearly futile psychoanalytic talk therapy on the schizophrenic patient, or we can give him 300 to 500 milligrams a day of clozapine. The scientific treatments are hundreds or thousands of times more effective than the alternatives. And even when the alternatives seem to work, we don't actually know that they played any role. Spontaneous remissions, even of cholera and schizophrenia, can occur without prayer and without psychoanalysis. Abandoning science means abandoning much more than air conditioning, CD players, hair dryers and fast cars. In hunter-gatherer pre-agricultural times, the human life expectancy was about 20 to 30 years. That's also what it was in Western Europe in late Roman and in medieval times. It didn't rise to 40 years until around the year 1870. It reached 50 in 1915, 60 in 1930, 70 in 1955, and is today approaching 80. A little more for women, a little less for men. The rest of the world is retracing the European increment in longevity. What is the cause of this stunning, unprecedented humanitarian transition? The germ theory of disease, public health measures, medicines and medical technology. Longevity is perhaps the best single measure of the physical quality of life. If you're dead, there's little you can do to be happy. This is a precious offering from science to humanity, nothing less than the gift of life. But microorganisms mutate. New diseases spread like wildfire. There is a constant battle between microbial measures and human countermeasures. We keep pace in this competition, not just by designing new drugs and treatments, but by penetrating progressively more deeply toward an understanding of the nature of life. Basic research. I know that science and technology are not just cornucopias pouring gifts out into the world 